The views and opinions of this program are those of the host guests and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. For over 95 years, we've set the bar. Power, we restored it. Protection, we reinvented it. Record yields, we redefined it. If there's one thing we know at FS, it's that just because something hasn't been done, doesn't mean it can't be done. We're never satisfied unless we take your farming operation to the next level. Run your equipment at peak efficiency and bust the bins this season. Visit fssystem.com. Well, of course, on Friday, we got the release of the December World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates report from USDA. Not many changes, which was pretty much as expected. There were a few things of note to talk about, though, but the grain trade mostly sold off into the weekend, while cattle saw a bit of a rally trying to end the week on somewhat of a positive note after more volatility. Joining us to talk about things, we welcome in Dwayne Bussey with Bolt Marketing here to Market Talk today. And Dwayne, good to catch up with you, my friend. As uh, I, I was joking a little bit before we went on the air, was there a WASDI report on Friday? Because it sure <laughs> didn't seem like it, uh, just with the way the trade kind of acted. But then again, December is typically a quiet report, isn't it, Dwayne? It, it is typically a quiet report. And yeah, I know earlier I got asked the question of when do we start talking about the January report? And it was like, looking at my watch, like probably in about 30 minutes. And you probably will with this too. It's going to be pretty quick. We'll start talking that January report. But I mean, a couple of changes and a couple of disappointing no changes, I guess, in some South America corn production. I'm sure you and I will talk about that. But yeah, fairly typical of your December report. Pretty quiet. Yeah, pretty quiet. I, I'd say the, the big changes I saw or at least the minimal changes I saw was uh, on the on the U.S. side, the domestic balance sheets. Uh, we got ending stocks for corn and wheat came down twenty five million. Uh, some changes to exports, but even that wasn't necessarily you know it was it was already kind of figured that we would see that in this report just with some of the export activity that's been happening here in the last few weeks. It, it is, but you know. When it comes to corn, I was kind of the bear of that market for quite a while, thinking exports, we were way behind the normal pace. You know, we weren't seeing the daily sales and I, I kind of felt like it was going to be lower and lower. So for me, this seeing it actually finally gain a little bit the last couple of reports is from USDA is kind of confirming that demand is actually growing. Um, I'm a little surprised. I, I guess the corn price got low enough where we got to a point where demand picked up. I think the lower trending U.S. dollar helped with that too. But you're right, 25 million bushel increase for corn export demand, lowered the ending stock the exact same. Now, we're still over 2.1 billion though, aren't we, Jesse? So it's mm -hmm. not like we have to go racing to six. I still get too many people asking me about $6 of corn. And I think we can put that to bed unless China goes berserk and buys every kernel they can in the world. <laughs> That's a very, very good point. Um, it, it seems like the Chinese have had more of an appetite for soft red winter wheat here this past week versus corn, although we, we've seen some corn sales scattered here and there, but more daily mm -hmm. flash sales of SRW on Friday morning, what, four out of five days? China's been uh, in the trade here buying Chicago wheat, Dwayne. Uh, how awesome is that? I mean, it's always bearish, 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 but no... Yeah, I think you get that combination, like I said, the lower U.S. dollar, and then our wheat prices are obviously got to <laughs> too low, it felt like. I was calling for a bottom for that for months, so I guess eventually you're right. If you stick to your guns, USDA increased export demand, 25 million bushels for wheat as well. No other changes to the S&D table, so the ending stock dropped 25 million. Great to see, and yeah, just this morning, China's back in still buying more wheat. I was a little surprised here, Jesse. I don't know if you were, but and remember, these reports aren't put together last night. Right. They're put together seven to 10 days ago. So I, I didn't think they would actually raise the wheat export demand. I thought it would have to be a more drastic adjust, adjustment of like maybe 50 or 75 million bushels next month. But they did show it here. So that's good. Maybe USDA knows that there's some demand out there. And man, it, you got to really feel like that low is in on wheat, don't you, Jesse? I mean, you, you got demand starting to increase. The supply is known. Um, now, don't get crazy here and do the wheat thin and rally a dollar so we don't export a single kernel again if we can have a slow steady increase here i really like the way the wheat market is looking here 
That's a great point. And maybe the uh, low is in the wheat market. Uh, we'll have to see. Uh, soybeans, no changes on the domestic side. Uh, everything was pretty quiet there. And o overall in the grain and oilseed trade on Friday, before we get to the global numbers, uh, we kind of sold off into the weekend. And you and I were talking about this as well. I, I have to think, I agree with you on this, I have to think this was just some profit taking maybe ahead of the weekend, Dwayne. I think it was, you know, the soybeans right now are really all about a weather forecast, aren't they? Because obviously USDA didn't make any changes, but it still shows that our supply domestically is tight. So we're all eyes are on South America crop. But I think what happened here recently in this pullback back down to $13 is the trade started to figure out that even if you trim off a little bit of the Brazil crop, they're increasing acres enough. And Argentina, remember, only had half of a crop last year. So if they don't have a disaster this year, which you wouldn't think they would two years in a row, the combination of the two countries, Jesse, is going to end up being a rather large soybean crop available starting in March, you know, late February, March for the rest of the world. So I think that pulled us down to this $13 mark. And that's going to make that $14 mark or that $13.98 we hit maybe be the short term high unless we can really get a weather scare event going, which is possible because it does seem like your typical weather market in a drought where rain's coming two weeks from now and then every time you get there they kick it down two more weeks uh, they're getting scattered rains and the crop is fine i think but uh yeah they, they'd like a good soaker that's for sure well and on the global numbers i know usda cut brazil's soybean crop slightly on the december yep. report that was it though no changes to corn no change to argentine production so uh, that was really the other number that uh, kind of stood out on the December report. And I think it's going to be interesting moving forward here. As you mentioned, that $13 level in beans. Uh, I was worried that when we broke that earlier in the week, that was going to lead us to some more downside pressure. But then we were able to rally back and finishing up the week right around 13 and Jan beans, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. That feels like an area to me that we can potentially maybe hold, but I still worry about some downside risk here in soybeans, Dwayne. <laughs> well, I'm right with you. It depends on the day. Yeah, I was with you. I, we struggled to stay above 13 for a while. That 1295 support would hold. And then earlier in the day when we were at the highs before the report, it felt like, yep, okay, 13 solid support. That's your buying area. Now that we're back down there, now I'm nervous again. So a typical emotional trade. You're right. Um, USA cut Brazil's soybean crop, 2 million metric ton. And not a big shock there with the, the dryness they've had. To me, the big surprise and disappointment I had today was they did not change Brazil's corn crop size. And USDA has been way higher than like a report like from CONAP, which is Brazil's form of USDA. They're at like 118 and we're at what, 129 USDA. So I thought for sure they were going to come down, I thought maybe five, six million metric tons. So to see no change was... That was disappointing to me, and I think a little bit disappointing in the corn market. Yeah, I think so, too. But now, as you mentioned, that January WASDE report, uh, it's time to start talking about it already, essentially. Because <laughs> that's always a very volatile, very big report. And it feels like between now and that report, uh, these grain markets as a whole probably just going to see a lot of fund-type position squaring, it would feel like, ahead of the Christmas and New Year holiday, Dwayne. Would you agree with that? Yeah, you're right. And that's a bit depressing too, because uh, yeah, that means not much commissions for a commission broker. If this goes sideways and <laughs> I've got Christmas gifts to buy, Jesse, it was, it was gonna be <laughs> gonna be thin trading for the Bolt family. No. Um, you're right. We'll probably get a quiet trade. Uh, we'll start talking about the January number and the numbers I'm worried about in there is is maybe actually the production side, the yield. Um, you know, I, I know I'm in an area that was blessed with rains this year, but man, everywhere in North Dakota, majority of South Dakota, there's still a little bit of harvest coming in some cornfields and elevators are still chalked full. Um, so obviously here it feels like it's a big crop and the production number could increase. There'll be a lot of debate between now and then, but yeah, maybe not a whole lot of trade until about January 2nd, I bet. Well, and I wonder too, uh, you mentioned that big crop kind of still coming in across the Dakotas and other areas have seen a big crop with elevators chock full. I feel like we saw a considerable amount of farmers selling around December options expiration, Dwayne, and now oh. it's probably going to be the job of basis to try and pry any more corn out of farmer hands, wouldn't you say? 
I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, that basically made the low in the DS market, you know, and it, it happened even a little bit after option expiration is more farmers were called and told like, hey, you got to do something with this contract. Nobody wants to do anything without permission, of course. So there was a lot of farmer selling. There was a lot of HDAs, a lot of sell contracts off that DS board. And you're right. Now that that's done, we've crept back up, haven't we? And the market looks very strong, actually. It's not going to rally as fast as us as producers, farmers want to see it go. Um, you know, guys want to see, are we going to get back to 525, 535? And I'm like, well, you need another story than what we have right now. This is going to be a slow grind higher. But you're right. Farmers, I think, have plenty of cash. I think they sold soybeans fairly heavy. I think that corn is going to be really hard to pry out. And yet, you know, I talk about the negative basis in my area where the production is big, but anywhere where there wasn't corn piles and they were short of crop, that basis is starting to improve quickly. And it'll be the basis job to move these bushels around. So, no, you're right. We can see better things down the road. We are joined today by Dwayne Bussey from Bolt Marketing here on Market Talk. Dwayne, as uh, we get ready to flip that calendar over to 24, I know it's uh, winter meeting season, it's uh, seed selling, seed buying season, inputs, etc. As you look out at uh, new crop 24 contracts here, any mm -hmm. thoughts there? Are, are you getting aggressive on some selling? Not so much. Has anything changed in, on that front since the last time we talked? No, nothing's changed for me. I'm still on a hold pattern. Not that not that I think the prices are going to end higher than where we're at right now come the end of next year. It's just more a seasonal play for me, Jesse, that, you know, now when we look forward and talk about the bearishness for 2024, you know, we could lose 4 million acres of corn and still have an any stock this high and higher. Oh God, well, we better sell everything at 512 today. Well, no, I don't. I'd rather not do that because that's assuming a 180 yield and everything's perfect. And just there's scares that happen, but you're right. It's tis the season for me to start working on that program. And if somebody wants to start selling here, I would not stop them. And at 525, you'll probably see me be fairly aggressive. All right, let's shift gears over to the protein sector. And I don't have my popcorn ready for cattle, but uh, man, oh man, uh, we got plenty to, to, to take a look at here. Um, Cattle been volatile. We've talked about it uh, here the last couple of weeks on the show. And Friday, we saw a decently higher day across fats and feeders on the futures trade. I just wonder, was it a dead cat bounce into the weekend, Dwayne? What do you think? <laughs> I <pause and laughs> See, like I said, I don't have my popcorn ready for this answer, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I will wait hey, to see what you have to say. Here. Yeah, good hard questions like that. I if I wasn't on video is where I start doing the K -K -K, you're cutting out. Sorry, no. Um, great <laughs> question, by the way, Jesse. Um, I don't think that's the low yet. Um, the reason I hesitate is we got down to some upward trend lines on continuous charts. And I think you've heard me talk about that before. It was at the 166 area for December live cattle. Now we bounced right back up to that today and closed right around that upward trend line. Cash at 170, so a 166 board is, is okay. $4 difference is about the max. I usually like to see it. So we, you know, if we can rally tomorrow, or not tomorrow, I'm sorry, next week, then you know I could say, well, maybe that was just one blip below the downward trend or upward trend line, and now we're back above. Here we go. But I'm just worried. This is just a profit taking end of the week. Let's get back some of our losses. Uh, we're oversold. Rally back, and I think the funds still want to sell out of this market, and that's really the whole reason this market has crashed this much, right? I mean, supply and demand isn't bad. Supplies are still tight. Uh, but I, I think the funds just want out. And when they want out of a market, uh, they can do this, especially the cattle market where they control so much position. So let's look for the commitment of traders report this week and to be key. Uh, keep an eye on that. I, I'm just a little bit worried they want out all of them. And that means they could drive this thing all the way down to some retracement levels like a 147 or a 135. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, I hate even saying that because I know there's people just cursing me out there that got cattle in the lots. But on pops, maybe look to buy some put options, some LRP contracts, something. Because it, if I'm right, technically, we're just starting to go lower. I was going to say, I was going to ask, and I'm glad you mentioned that there at the end of that answer. Just some thoughts uh, for folks to protect their risk here in this volatile environment. I know we got some updated uh, 
you know, beef, pork, poultry production numbers yep. on the WASD, largely no notes there. So I don't think there was any any help really from that. Um, export sales this past week, I know that beef number for 23 was 200 metric tons. The 24 number was pretty good. Uh, pork looked to be okay. So, I mean, I think you're right. I think demand's there. It's just um, – it's been a tough go in this cattle market, I think, altogether. And so it comes back to just making sure you manage your risk here as best as you can through a volatile window. Yeah, you know, go back and learn through this process, which is what we all have to do to keep moving forward. I think it stresses, again, that probably the most important report of the week is the commitment to traders report. Yeah. Um it's hard to read a little bit and it's always a delayed report. And yes, I hate that. You know, it's as of Tuesday's close, but watch where these funds are at. And I'm not saying just do the opposite of them because they have to exit contracts. Just be leery. Um, those, the guy that bought the put options a couple of months back or a couple of weeks back, even looking all right right now. And I mean, that's easy to say, but like I said, just look at it this weekend and see just how long the funds still are. And now if you're a fund and you see a chart, do you want to be long cattle? Probably not. Um, so it is scary. That's something to learn. Watch that commitment trades report. And even though, uh, put options are expensive, sometimes they do work. Hog trade on Friday was a bit higher. I wonder if that was maybe some sympathy following of cattle possibly into the weekend. Hogs have been, uh, just a, a dismal market kind of as well. I feel not as volatile, but still hasn't been fun to watch hogs here either, Dwayne. <laughs> no, it hasn't. I really was bothered by the middle of this week, Smithfield announced that they were dropping, what, like 26 farms or something up in yep. Utah, which in one way it's like, well, yeah, why are you feeding hogs there anyway? <laughs> but uh, not, nothing against Utah. It's just that, you know, how much soybean meal and feed is around that area. So anyway, let me get to my point. Uh, that's probably a drop in the bucket in the total production wise dropping those farms, but it's what Smithfield said. Uh, there's too much production out there. Nobody's making money and we just want it out of these contracts. And it's like something like that, as you well know, that really snowballs through the livestock and hog industry as far as uh, market news. That's negative. We're still talking about China with their huge herd. Uh, yeah, it, it's just tough. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying hogs have to go screaming lower, but, boy, uh, that upside is very limited. There's a ceiling that keeps kind of falling down on it, I think. So yeah, we probably keep a trend line going a little bit lower on hogs, sadly. So I'm, I'm full of great news today. I know. Well, I mean, you know, hey, the, the news is the news, right, Dwayne? And I'm glad you brought up the news of the Smithfield closures in Utah because I think that the market did notice that. We've seen Smithfield yep. closures and restructuring in Missouri, too, and things of that nature. And then with China, you mentioned their hog herd, Chinese hog prices have been dismal. So, I mean, to your point there, there's, it just feels like there's a lot weighing on this hog market and really just weighing on the protein sector as a whole. And I'll sh let that shift us into the economy a little bit here to wrap up today. Um, I know we got some jobs data out Friday. We're looking at the federal reserve meeting again this next week ahead a lot of talk about interest rates, of course. It's end of the year. A lot of farmers and ranchers got to go talk to their banker for uh, their operating loan needs if they have them, et cetera. So, I mean, economy-wise, I know that's still something that we continue to talk about as being kind of the overarching thing here uh, affecting grains and livestock trade away. Yeah, it sure is, isn't it? And the jobs number was just fine today. It was nothing surprising. So that's good. I always just get a little bit nervous with those numbers. Um, when you talk to the outside markets, uh, one thing I noticed this week is you know crude oil dipping below mm -hmm. 70 bucks. And I love it from my pocketbook because it seems like we're driving around chasing kids everywhere. I Yeah, we're generating the economy ourselves, I think, or yeah. keeping it running. But anyway... Yeah, the, the lower gas prices are great, but you ever watch some of these charts, Jesse, and overlap like a crude oil chart with cattle right now uh, and the corn market even. Yes, the corn market's fine and low and going, but crude oil kind of drives the whole commodity complex. Um, and, and I'm not saying crude oil's made a low and going to rally up from here, even though I, I we maybe did with the government today talking about buying oil for reserves at these cheaper prices. Um but there's a lot of production out there, not a ton of demand. We, we need to see that pick up for the rest of the commodities to go up. So I guess trying to wrap everything up here is I, I'm friendly to grains. Um, 
but it's just, it's not going to go up like this. We don't have a shortage. We're not going to run out of corn. <laughs> so we're not going to be six, seven, $8 corn. That's not happening. So when you get the rallies, you know, they'll be selling opportunities, but I do really like that USDA added some export demand for corn and wheat. I, I think we put in some significant lows, Jesse. Let's say that that sounds a lot better when I talk about, it. I think we put in some lows instead of me talking about how low cattle can go. I was going to say, looking at the glass half full versus half empty there, I think that's a good way to wrap it up here today, Dwayne. <laughs> if uh, if folks want to have a conversation with you as they're looking at their uh, year-end marketing plans and more, I know now's a good time to do that. How can they get a hold of you there at Bolt Marketing? Yeah, they can just call us here direct, 605-448-2365. And they can always check us out online at boltmarketingllc.com. Dwayne Bussey with Bolt Marketing. Always appreciate the time and the knowledge. Thanks for a conversation today, Dwayne. Have a great one, and we'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Jesse. All right. That's going to do it for Market Talk here today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great weekend.